Ladies and gentlemen, uh, my name is David Cunningham Owens. I'm Professor of Clinical Psychiatry here in Edinburgh, and it's my pleasure to host this evening's uh, event. This is the sixth year that the university has run its Medical Detective Series lectures, inspired, of course, by perhaps one of the greatest sleuth creators of all time, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, who was a medical student here between 1876 and 1881. Um, I believe that this lecture theatre was opened in 1878, so it's very possible that some of you are sitting in the very seats that he himself might have sat on. Though I'm very pleased to say we have a lady here with us this evening who was a student here before the war, would you believe, and tells us that the seats were a lot less comfortable then than they are now. So I, think, I don't think it's the original seats of Arthur Corindale that you're sitting in, but very welcome indeed to see you back. Lovely to, to have you. Um, the lecture series is designed to show that sleuthing didn't end with Arthur Conan Doyle, that there is still a deal of sleuthing going on in Edinburgh in, in supporting its really international reputation in medical research. Uh, and we hope that this lecture series will uh, enlighten you into what's going on in what's sometimes often seen as being done behind closed walls. Nothing, is the, nothing could be further from the truth. We're very keen to share the research that happens in the university with you, and hopefully we can educate you, inform you, and who knows, maybe even inspire you. I've no doubt that each of these will apply to our uh, lecturer this evening, uh, Dr. Richard Chin. Dr. Chin is consultant paediatric neurologist at the Royal Hospital for Sick Children and clinical uh, senior lecturer at the university. He's also director of the Muir Maxwell Epilepsy Centre at the university, which is one of these so-called centres without walls. That is a, a, a network of individuals of different expertise who come together to solve common problems of interest. Dr. Chin graduated from the University of the West Indies I don't think that's a line that would ever mean in my CV, Richard. I think the beaches would have been too much of a distraction. But after that, he uh, gained a Commonwealth Fellowship and moved to the Institute of Child Health in Great Ormond Street, uh, where he developed his interest in pediatric neurology and in particular in uh, epilepsy. Um, not just at the research level, but also at the clinical and service development level. And when he moved to Edinburgh in 2011, I've no doubt that London's loss was Edinburgh's gain. Epilepsy, of course, is one of the oldest known medical syndromes, and I'm sure that Richard will be going into some of the history of this. We have accounts that any clinician nowadays would recognize going back over 4,000 years. And of course, it was thought to be possession. Only Hippocrates, the great Hippocrates of Kos, railed against uh, uh, this narrow-mindedness, claiming this was a disease of the brain, his great disease, as he called it, but it took about 2,000 years nearly for the rest of medicine to catch up with them before we were able to agree that it is a medical condition and one which is often uh, uh, deeply damaging uh, uh, and uh, very distressing, not only for uh, relatives but for sufferers. As I mentioned, I'm sure uh, Richard will go into some of the history, but I just want to add on a personal note that actually, according to a very credible theory, epilepsy may have played more than a minor role in the, the development of my own discipline, namely psychiatry. Uh, Sigmund Freud uh, developed a lot of his ideas from a particularly complex case called Anna O, or Bertha Pappenheim as she was, uh, and there's good evidence that indeed she didn't suffer from relationship or family or neurotic problems at all, but may have suffered from a particular form of epilepsy. Now you may think that is an example of bad things developing out of bad mistakes or great things developing out of errors, who knows, but certainly it may have played a, a, an important role. And also Charles Altamont Doyle, the father of Arthur, who certainly in his later life at least developed for whatever reason uh, uh, form, a form of epilepsy. So how appropriate is it to be giving this lecture in this venue, in this lecture theatre? It gives me great pleasure to call upon Dr. Richard Chin to deliver his lecture, Unlocking the Mysteries of Childhood Epilepsy. Dr. Chin. Thank you very much for such a um, generous and kind introduction. I'm acutely aware that they, within the audience there are people here who are basic scientists, they are clinicians, but probably more importantly for me, they're also families and patients and also parents of patients. And I'm hoping that I'll be able to pitch this at a level that is 
um, readily understandable by most persons. And if you want more specific details on the scientific aspects, then I'm happy to do so afterwards. Now, the first thing, um, as in all things, we need to find out what the mystery is. And I think I probably would like two volunteers, one who is a medic and one who is not a medic. So Rory, as the medic, and I need a non-medic. I'll, I'll volunteer Anne then. <laughs> So, and just to make things a little bit um, more equal, I'll give you that. <laughs> and if you put that around your neck, that might be helpful. So I'm just going to play a series of videos, and it's a simple thing. I just want you to say epilepsy, yes or no. Is that OK? So play a video. You look at the video, and you say, does this person have epilepsy, yes or no? So this is the first one. So she's been instructed to lie still. She's hyperventilating. And she's having these movements towards her face. And that's it. So she's not having generalized movements, but that's all that she has. So we'll go ladies first. What do you think, Anne? Epilepsy, yes or no? You would say no. Rory? OK, so that one, one for the medics. <clears throat> so this other one, so being monitored here. So he was talking, he stops talking suddenly, and he has these movements, which is relatively short-lived. Rory, your turn. I'm going to say no. You say no. OK. Huh? I'm going to say yes. OK, good. <laughs> I won't say yet. <laughs> <laughs> and the final one. OK. So she was asleep, sudden rousing. She turns towards the left. She's not responding to name calling. And then she has these involuntary movements. Anne, what do you think? Yes. Yes. Okay. So epilepsy, yes, but not a generalized tonic chronic seizure, which represents the fact that you can have different kinds of seizures, and sometimes it can be quite subtle. This one didn't have epilepsy, but on a background, those episodes were not epilepsy, but on a background of someone who has epilepsy. But those particular events were not seizures. And the last one was not epilepsy at all. So it shows that actually sometimes it's really, really, really difficult to tease out what are seizures and what are not seizures. And how do we go about doing that is one of the mysteries and one of the challenges that we face on a day-to-day -day basis. And so my children and several other people constantly ask, what is epilepsy? Exactly what is epilepsy? And I'll talk a little bit about that. But in essence, we all have normal brain electrical activity. And in epilepsy, there is sudden, unexpected, abnormal discharge of electrical activity. And depending on exactly where in the brain that occurs, there will be a number of different symptoms and a number of different manifestations. So the first thing to take away is that epilepsy is not just one thing. It can be a myriad of different syndromes with over 40 syndromes involved. I'm going to talk a bit more, quite a bit, about epilepsy being more than just seizures. And finally, I'm going to end up with some no talking about some novel treatments and with some trials that we are about to undertake here in Edinburgh. So um, you would have heard a little bit about the history. Um, and it's quite a colorful history because We've actually been known, epilepsy has been known about since antiquity. And this is a Egyptian hieroglyphic. And you can see they were very, very advanced because here you can see wave activities. This represents um, a cobra, which suggests that it's coming from God. And even in the presence of um, bales of cloth or in reeds or in a loaf of bread, 
it can be quite dangerous. So what you see is a man um, who is um, crouched with a bow, but being very fearful. And this represents really um, uh, an annotation of epilepsy from ancient hieroglyphics. And you will see from here that uh, for people who've been to the Louvre in, um, in France, there is um, a um, iron structure here, which has the Hammurabi code, which really gave a, a code of behavior um, of how one should um, um, behave in daily, daily life. And this was in um, Babylonian um, era. And it states very clearly that a person with epilepsy could not marry or testify in court. So we have a belief that it's coming from God from much earlier on. But from very early on, we will see that people with epilepsy are really stigmatized and really inhibited from a societal point of view about the things that they are allowed to do and the things that they are legally and able to do. You heard a mention about Hippocrates, the father of epilepsy, or not rather the father of medicine. And it was really enlightening that Hippocrat Hippocrates rather, sorry, um, identified a cause for the epilepsy. He said the cause lies in the brain. This is not superstition. This is not because of spirits. This is not because of God. And then he went on to talk about the releasing factors. What are the precipitating factors? These are things that we use on a day-to-day -day basis, even to this day. He talked about this, the fact that it's responsive to the cold, the sun, and the winds. In other words, in my mind, these are saying environmental factors can make an influence, and I'll come back to that. He talked about treatment, not by magic, but by diet and drugs. Again, emphasizing the fact that it's not just drugs, but it's also environmental factors that we need to take into consideration. And people say, why is it called epilepsy? Well, the Greeks didn't just give us Hippocrates. They also gave us the name that we use today. So the ancient Greek name was epilambanin, which means to be seized. Hence the name, still, we talk about seizures, to be overwhelmed by surprise. And I take it, that's part of the reason why in Scotland, people say they are taken with a seizure or he took a seizure because it's all this to be seized or to be overwhelmed with it. But even in more enlightened times during um, Christianity, you would have found that even in the Gospel of Mark, that there was still a bit of uncertainty as exactly what is the cause. We go back to a quotation talking about a very good description of generalized tonic-clonic seizures here in Mark chapter 9, and ascribing the cause for it as being a possession. So we have demonic possession, we have spiritual reasons, we have sources of the brain, exactly what's the cause. So it's not surprising when you look at the different kinds of treatments throughout the years, there was human sacrifice, there was exorcism, and there were lots of plants that were used, and you see a list there. But it's quite poignant that being in this anatomy lecture theater where a lot of dissections um, used to take place, that actually human skull scrapings of the opposite sex was still one of the things that was used as a treatment. And the first antiepileptic medication used was bromide. And in many, many places, bromide is no longer used, but it's an interesting story about the use of bromide. So this was in 1857, and um, there was a presentation at the Royal Society of Medicine in London, and they presented 52 cases of um, women who only had seizures during their menstrual period. And at that time, um, the personal physician to the queen, who, um, whose name is that unfortunate name, <laughs> Um, but um, he said, actually, I have some patients who are exactly like that. And some German colleagues use bromide with a view that if you suppress the sexual urges, then actually the seizures can go away. He used it and used it quite successfully. And so there was a hypothesis that, well, if you could use it in women successfully around the time of their period, why not use it to women who are not having their periods or use it to men? And they did that, and lo and behold, the seizures stopped. A lot of other things stopped as well. <laughs> so, so bromide didn't last um, for very long in, uh, in the general usage. And then phenobarbitone was the first really recognized uh, antiepileptic drug in the 20th century, and that was only discovered 
um, accidentally when we were looking at analytics. So part of this is really linked to the fact that the underlying cause is very difficult to determine sometimes. And exactly why is it that there's this imbalance between the excitatory synapses and the inhibitory synapses, what drives that still remains a bone of contention. And there are other medications and surgery that are now used today. So who are the famous people that have been diagnosed with epilepsy? Well, Abbott, but Abbott has definitely had epilepsy. But you would have seen just from this example here, n equals two, that sometimes there's a lot of uncertainty associated with it. And sometimes psychiatric symptoms or symptoms that are ascribed to psychiatric problems could actually be due to um, epilepsy. And so we have an illustration of some people who are thought to have had epilepsy, but we can't prove it. So Joan of Arc, Van Gogh, and also Alexander the Great are just some of the people who are thought to have epilepsy. But because there was no real biomarker, no real diagnostic tool for it, aside from the history, which is still very important, we're not sure if they had epilepsy or they had a psychiatric disorder or something else. So how do we solve that? Well, we're not going to go to McDonald's and we're not going to have a hamburger. But the reason for that is because of Hans Burger. So Hans Burger, <laughs> Hans Burger, I know it's a bit cheesy, sorry. <laughs> so Hans Burger was really the inventor of the EEG. And I think when you were coming in, some of this, um, some of our volunteers here might have um, given you an opportunity to feel the kind of gels that were being used. If not, then I can allow you to feel it afterwards. And if Becky, if you could pass around the electrodes so you can get a sense of, um, of um, what happens with an EEG. And the story about um, Hans Berger is very interesting. So Hans didn't actually start off as a neurophysiologist. So he wanted to be a cavalry, um, a, cap medical, uh, uh, a military cavalry horseman. And whilst in training one day, um, his horse railed up suddenly in front of a horse-drawn carriage. And he fell in front of the carriage, and fortunately they were able to stop the carriage very quickly. Um, but he was extremely scared. And at that very moment, many miles away, his sister had this sense that something was seriously wrong with Hans. She didn't know why, but she thought she had this overwhelming fear that something was wrong with him and suggested to her dad and insisted to her dad that, she had to that he had to send a telegram to find out how Hans was. And Hans was completely convinced that this was a telekinetic transmission of his thoughts or his worries that his sister was able to pick up. So he then left and, um, from the cavalry and decided that he was going to study medicine and then discovered a way of trying to um, deter, detect this electrical activity. And in 1924, this is a copy of the first tracing that was done by Hans. And he was so excited about it, but so fearful about it, that in 1929 was when he actually, five years later, was when he actually published it. And no one believed him because they thought of his background that he couldn't really be um, uh, that elegant in his description. And so it was not until in 1934 that someone replicated his findings that it suddenly came about. And it was then until 1937, so 13 years after it was first discovered, that it actually started coming into clinical practice. It doesn't sound dissimilar to what happens in the, these days, but it's 13 years, and it just really shows that sometimes the gap between discovery and implementation can be quite long. So fast forward to where we are today. What is the cause? So despite advancing in imaging, despite advances in genetics and in um, various different aspects of medicine, in 75% 70 of cases, the cause is still unknown. Another mystery is that it's not just seizures, but there is a very, very close correlation, a very big overlap between seizures and other um, disorders, such as ADHD and ASD, and I'll present some data on that. And again, Fast forward hundreds of a hundred years later, and still 30% of children, so it's three out of 10 children, still remain refractory to all kinds of treatments that we have available. So for every 10 patients, three 
still have seizures every day, and what do you do about that? And we'll address some of those questions. So in terms of genetics very quickly, what are the clues for genetics? Well, twin studies obviously are um, a good indicator, and you can see from twins that some twins have epilepsy, and there are two big registries that demonstrate that. And there's a higher concordance in the monozygotic twins, as you'd expect. So these are real signals that there's a genetic basis for it. But actually, it's not that simple. So when we look at the genetic causes, there has been some advances in the monogenic syndromes. So these are, which, these are syndromes in which there's a single gene mutation or a single gene that is affected. And a classical example is the sodium channel um, uh, mutation, SCN1A, which is really the mutation which underlies Dravet syndrome, which Muir has, which the center is named after. But even amongst people who have the same genetic mutation, their presentation can be completely different. So why is it that this genotype phenotype variability is not unique to epilepsy, but this is an area that needs real um, interrogation? And interestingly, is that 95% of the mutations are spontaneous mutations. They're not inherited in any way at all. What is driving that? What is it that happens? And I would argue that these, and this is what we're investigating, whether these are environmental causes that are really driving the de novo mutations. There's complex inheritance in which you can have um, skipping of different generations because of incomplete penetrance. And sometimes because of gonadal mosaicism, not every cell in the body has exactly the same genetic makeup. But there's also polygenic inheritance where a number of genes that are, invent, uh, are involved and you might have a genetic predisposition for it, and, but it's environmental factors that really drive it forward or allow these genes to be expressed. And as an illustration of that, here is one example. So that um, um, figure here represents a human papilloma virus. And human papilloma virus has been widely linked to that of cervical cancer, to the point where um, now we're having immunizations against human papilloma virus to prevent cervical cancer. But actually, when you look at the histology of cervical cancer, the appearance is very, very similar to some forms of brain um, uh, brain um, cortical abnormalities. So these are developmental abnormalities that look exactly the same as um, for cervical cancer. So the hypothesis was that actually was it the human papilloma virus that in this particular aspect of brain malformation was it responsible for that brain malformation. And they've done a series of studies um, both in, in human specimens as well as animal studies that show actually in that particular form of cortical malformation that the human papilloma virus is extremely highly um, uh, found in those, um, that particular lesion. So we can see a possibility that actually immunization against human papilloma virus can actually stop some forms of uh, brain malformations which cause epilepsy, an environmental cause. So this is some work that I'm doing um, in collaboration with colleagues in Norway. And so this is 110,000 women recruited during pregnancy with the idea of trying to look at factors during pregnancy and modulators after pregnancy and how those affect risk for epilepsy. And these are some preliminary results. And we show that smoking increases your risk by 40% and breastfeeding is actually protective as well. And if you have a worsening socioeconomic status or in this case, if dads are older, that increases your risk as well. And we're looking very keenly and carefully at maternal diet. We're looking at infections, and I see colleagues in here who have an interest in infections, and also looking at the role of inflammation as well. The other big area that um, there's been a lot of advancement in inflammation, in um, understanding the cause, rather, of epilepsy is in inflammation. And you will see there's a list here of different um, antibodies that are now being associated um, with um, uh, the cause for epilepsy. So there is a latent infection, and then your body mounts a response to that, and it's the excess response that really um, precipitates the seizures. And that's really a major um, advancement in that area. So I've talked quite a bit about um, the cause 
Um, but actually, what I'm more interested in is what are the associated problems and what are the mechanisms um, on the underlying that. So Paul Soren is a postdoc um, researcher uh, in Norway, and um, Paul published this paper. And what he did was to look for the first time at the overlap between epilepsy and other neurological conditions. So PDD refers to uh, pervasive developmental disorders or people who have an autistic-like feature, um, specific language impairment, cerebral palsy, and mental retardation. And if you put them all together, you will see that amongst people who are diagnosed, that in this Norway population, 40% of them have an additional problem aside from just epilepsy. So that's a big burden. You might say, well, actually, that's only if you're diagnosed. So you must have reached a threshold in which you're concerned enough to go to a physician or go to um, have an assessment. And when that happens, 40%. That's a significant number. But what happens if you tested everyone that you could? <coughs> Sorry. And this is some work that has been done in collaboration with colleagues at UCL. And what we looked at <coughs> was school aged children between the ages of 5 and 15, and found all the children in that particular area that had epilepsy, <coughs> Sorry. and tested them. And what we found was that 80%, 80% of children who were tested had a behavioral problem or some cognitive impairment. And only a third of those were previously diagnosed. Only a third. So this is a big problem. It's not just the seizures. It's the additional problems as well. And so if we go away and think about just the seizures, we're missing a big burden in epilepsy. And when we looked at epilepsy factors, that influenced it. So the onset, the number of medications that they were on, <coughs> they did not predict the behavioral problem. So this information suggests to us that actually there is a big burden. And if we concentrate again on the seizures, they were missing the big picture. We really need to be treating those and addressing those completely independently of the seizures. And this is just a description of the different types of behavioral problems and um, learning problems. You will see the usual culprits, autistic spectrum disorder, ADHD, but also you will see that even at this age, you can detect depression symptoms and anxiety symptoms, so more internalizing symptoms rather than externalizing symptoms. And these are things that we have to bear in mind. But that was in the school-aged children. Have we missed the boat? Can we actually find these children from earlier on? Can we determine? from a preschool setting, can we find these problems and therefore put in place much earlier interventions for educational um, attainment? And this is work which has been done by Matthew Hunter, a PhD student in our group. And he's, um, his study is called a Neuroprofile Study and looking at Fife and Lothian epilepsy groups. And um, this is ongoing work, as I said, but what Matthew found that in children under the age of five, the incidence is about 53 per 100,000. And what that translates out to me is that in the entire UK, there are about 4,000 children every year with this problem that I'm going to talk about. And if you look at the cognitive skills, the controls are in green and the epilepsy patients are in blue. And there's a wide separation in various different cognitive domains. So even on the age of five, this is at the point of diagnosis, there is a clear separation between the epilepsy patients and, um, and the controls. So we know that there are problems and we can detect those problems. But it's not just the cognitive problems, this is the other problems as well. So if you look at emotional problems, social problems, and social competence problems, Again, there is a wide separation. So those that are in blue are the ones that score worse, and those that are in green are the controls, and you can see that separation. So it's not just cognitive problems, but they have behavioral problems, and they are detectable. And you may say, well, actually, it's just from a battery of tests. Who has the time to spend three hours or four hours assessing each and every child? Well, there are screening methods that can be used. And this is some work that has been done in collaboration with my colleagues over at SickKids. And what we did was just use a simple 
screening method, which is a child behavior checklist. This was done by um, a medical student um, during their fourth year, so we expand our group. And we had 87 participants, and 60% of them on this screening had behavioral problems. So with a simple screening method, we can detect in the clinic, and this is something that we are implementing as we go along. So we can pick up the children and make a difference to them. What was also interested with what Joanna did was to ask the question of whether um, socioeconomic status made any difference or not. And sure enough, those who are more socioeconomically deprived um, were actually worse. Um, so they had a greater associated risk of having um, behavioral problems. And even further, that they were less likely to be known by the CAMS team. So someone from a lower socioeconomic status, more likely to have behavioral problems, need more help, but actually these are the children that are getting less help. And these are the areas that we really need to concentrate on and that we're continuing to work on. So you might say, okay, so that's all testing again, but is there something else that we can use? Can we use some objective markers? So this is work done by Matthew again, and what he's looking at was eye tracking. So eye tracking, um, children are given a different um, stimulus. They're put in front of a screen, and they have a device at the bottom which can look at what their eye movements are like. And what he was showing is that when they look at face scanning, when you look at the peripheral features versus the central features, that the control patients actually like to look at the faces. They like to look at the details in the mouth, around the eyes, and so on. They really like that, compared to the epilepsy patients that have no preference at all. And that gives an indication of sort of social preference. So it's a marker, we think, of um, a possible biomarker for social perception or social cognition. And what about saccadic control? So if you were to look at one object and try to tell the patient not to look at the new object that comes along, what happens? Well, the controls are able to stop that, so they won't look at the new stimulus, they will obey the command, but epilepsy patients won't do that. So eye tracking, again, is something that could be used as a biomarker. But what about the imaging techniques that we use? And this is a big um, section in our group. <clears throat> um, using standardized um, MR techniques that are developed here in Edinburgh, the scanning software that was acquired through the Mira Maxwell Trust at Sick Kids, we can now do parcellation or segmentation of the cortex of, um, of the brain. So this gives a nice reputation of what happens in the cortex. But we can't just, we can do it not just in the entire brain, but we can look at specific structures within the brain itself. We can look at different tracks or different areas that connect the different parts of the brain. And we can actually look at connectivity throughout the entire brain to see what parts of the brain talk with which other parts. And in effect, create what is a network. So we can understand what parts of the brain, how the different parts are connected, and try to understand what's the best way to address those. And um, this is work that is being done by Michael, Julie, Rory, and Mark. And uh, Michael is already showing that in epilepsy patients that actually there's a specific part of their brain which is smaller compared to everywhere else, and that is very closely correlated to cognition. So again, you might see a situation in the future in which someone has suspected epilepsy, they have these tests plus their EEG plus the eye tracking for us to better define if they have epilepsy, the type of epilepsy that they could have, and their risk for having cognitive and behavioral problems. But what about EEG? Well, there's been an elegant piece of work which is done by some Taiwanese patient, Taiwanese researchers rather, and they looked at 12 patients versus 11 controls. And what they did is that they were able to look at the EEG and be able to predict those that are likely to be refractory to treatment versus those who are not. So instead of spending years trying different antiepileptic medications at diagnosis, if they have this EEG, and they don't respond, then you can move them much more quickly into epilepsy surgery programs. So that's work that has been done by Taiwanese groups. But Javier Escudero, who is an engineer within our group, is looking at EEG predictors for neurodevelopmental problems. So not just response to medication, but can we help to counsel and can we help to put in other interventions to deal with neurodevelopmental problems at a much earlier stage? 
So in terms of the psychosocial aspects, the cognitive and behavioral problems are common. It's not due to the seizures, and the problems are readily identifiable even preschool. We've also been looking at patient views, and this is work by um, Susan Duncan and also um, uh, Rebecca, who is uh, about to start, trying to look at the views of children with epilepsy and also the views of people who with SUDEP. And most people want to know about SUDEP, but they don't want to know about it at diagnosis, but quite early on. Now, in this section, I'm going to talk about treatments, and I know that there are some people here who are particularly keen to hear about that. First one I want to talk about is environmental enrichment. So in animal models, when you look at environmental enrichment, so rather than using in their usual standard um, way of keeping the animals, if you gave, in this case, rodents more friends to play with, if you gave them better food, if you gave them exercise um, things and toys to play with, actually, their seizures got better. Their behavior got better as well. And if you sacrifice those animals and you looked at their gene expression, actually their gene expression is completely different. So there is change, not just at the behavioral level and at the clinical level, but also at the molecular level, there are changes purely from environmental enrichment. So it does beg the question about whether environmental enrichment could be a novel um, therapeutic strategy. And Bonnie Ayung is looking at this in conjunction with Zoe, um, looking with Epilepsy Scotland to see if educational programs within schools make a difference to long-term outcomes. And also some work being done by Tommy, um, looking at um, the role of health inequalities and differences in geographic location within um, Scotland and how those are, um, are affected. Slime molds and coconuts. So slime molds and coconuts. So as a student, I used to have periods in which um, I didn't clean my bath as um, perhaps frequently as I could. But actually, I found out now that slime molds actually produce a free fatty acid. And coconuts produce a free fatty acid that actually might be very good in epilepsy indeed. So when you look at sodium valproate, sodium valproate is a medication that is very commonly used in epilepsy treatment, but it's a free fatty acid. And so the thinking was, actually, can we find naturally occurring free fatty acids that could mimic the action of valproate? And of course, they found them in the slimy molds, and they found them in coconuts as well. And when you look here, you'll see this is a control agent. And when you look at valproate, it looks at the frequency of epileptiform discharges. Valproate has fewer epileptiform discharges. But look at all these others. And in one in particular, this one, is decanoic acid. So this is a freely occurring free fatty acid. And if you want to know what it smells like, it's what gives lamb or mutton that characteristic smell. That's what decanoic acid is. And actually, it has an even more potent anti-seizure property compared to valproate in a naturally occurring agent. It has lower liver problems. And if you expose pregnant pups to that, there is less teratogenicity, which is being a big issue with valproate. The other interesting thing is that coming from a completely different angle, in the ketogenic diet, decanoic acid is extremely high in the ketogenic diet. And so there are thoughts that perhaps the high decanoic acid content is really the, the answer behind the ketogenic diet. So it, it is possible, if that is true, that instead of going through a rigorous regimental program, that actually, uh, with a ketogenic diet, actually having just regular doses of decanoic acid might actually do the trick. So I said 70% um, will respond and 30% are still refractory. Then maybe the way that we've been approaching trying to find treatments is because we need to think more laterally. And this is work which is done by my cousin who is sitting up there. Um, and Mike, please correct me if I have any of this wrong, right? So Mike really leads on the preclinical side of things. And in essence, there are chemical gaps that occur um, in, and there are neurotransmitters or chemicals that are released across that gap in order to create um, a neuronal discharge. And when that happens, those chemicals have to be recycled in some way. And this is the normal way in which um, this would be done. 
So in mild stimulation, what you have is what's called Catherine-mediated endocytosis. So you have um, the release of the chemicals, and then they're actually being recycled. But in strong stimulation, such as in seizures, the kind of recycling mechanism is different. It's one called activity-dependent bulk endocytosis, or bulk endocytosis in short. But with bulk endocytosis, when that happens, they are refractory to current treatments. So therefore, problems with that recycling mechanism may predispose you to having seizures, or, um, or it might be neuroprotective, depending on the direction. And there's evidence from animal work, again, which shows that um, genetic mutations along that pathway are all result, uh, can all result in very, very difficult to control seizures. So actually, if we can address this particular problem or address mutations or find chemicals that work within this pathway, they may actually be neuroprotective or they may actually stop seizures altogether. And that's just a slide to say that we are looking not just in, um, in rodents, but we're looking from human samples as well as part of the Triple D project to identify those gene mutations. So the last part I'm going to talk about is phytocannabinoids. And I'm going to ask for three volunteers to help me now, very quickly. You can come up or you can come up. So Michael, if you get. So what I want to do from the public, all right, from the audience, we're going to have three sections, the roots, the leaves, or the flowers. OK. So who thinks that the greatest, con greatest concentration of phytocannabinoids is in the roots? Just put your hand up. The greatest concentration of phytocannabinoids is in the roots. OK, great. It must be in the leaves, then. Who says the leaves? Put your hand up. Probably a little bit more. OK. And who says the flowers? I think the leaves have it, just marginally. Well, actually, it's the flowers. <laughs> it's the flowers, OK? So actually, the phytocannabinoid concentration in um, the leaves is less than 1%. Same applies to the roots. But in the unseeded flowers, it's more than 20% inside there. Seeded ones are a bit um, less. But it's really the flowers. <clears throat> and it, that's me there looking in, um, in one of the, f the factories. Not my factory, <laughs> I should answer. Um, and I got these slides from GW Pharma, which is the pharmaceutical company which has the UK license to grow this um, legally. So I'm going to show you very quickly a series of slides which shows you the preclinical evidence behind ca um, ca uh, phytocannabinoids. And there are more than 60 different types of phytocannabinoids. These are extracts from the cannabis plant. Probably the most commonly known one is a THC, um, and that one is the one that really causes the hallucinogenic properties and gives the highs. But as I said, there's more than 60 different types. And actually, if you can isolate specific phytocannabinoids, they can be quite beneficial. And the one that is attracting most attention is one called cannabidiol. So cannabidiol, um, in basic science or preclinical data, is shown to have some effects. So there are two models here. One is a magnesium model, and one is a 4AP model. And if you don't use any, if when you introduce cannabinoids, it causes a suppression of the seizure activity, which you can pick up um, looking at hippocampal slices. And this is comparable to epileptic medications that are currently in use. So that's on brain slices. Take one step up. What happens when you look in rodents? So when you look in rodents, the area in white um, represents the control. And these are increasing doses of cannabidiol. Remember, this is not marijuana. This is just an extract which does not have the hallucinogenic properties and does not have the psychoactive component in it. And you will see that as you increase the dose, actually, the number of seizures decrease. And you look at this in five different models, one, two, three, four, five different models, and CBD is effective in all of those models. And what happens if you mix it with other antiepileptic medication? So in this um, situation, it's mixed with valparate, and you mix it with ethosuximide. And in both cases, there is no significant interaction. And in the case of valparate, actually, it has an additive effect. 
So this is basic science data suggesting actually it might be very effective indeed. Is it something that is tolerable? So this is a static beam test, given the agent, and then you see how quickly and how far um, the animal can go across the beam without falling off. And you can see this in terms of the number of failures. Those that are treated with CBD have a very, very low failure rate compared to other regularly used antiepileptic medications. They travel much further compared to regular antiepileptic medications. So it doesn't just have an anti-seizure effect in this model, but in terms of its adverse effects on coordination and motor difficulties, it doesn't have any of those problems either or significantly less. What about toxicology and safety? Obviously very worrying. When you look at the basic science data, again, all of this suggests that it is quite safe. But all of this is done in adult models, and none of this has actually been done in the developing brain. So none of this work has been in, done in young animals. So exactly how it works and how it responds in children, we don't know. So obviously after that, there's a lot of interest in trying to use this medication, CBD. And then initial studies actually were very um, uh, not discouraging. So in 1974, actually they, some, a patient that was given CBD, it made their EEG activity worse, but there was no clinical seizure correlation at all. So just electrically, but their seizures didn't actually, that were manifested outwardly, didn't get worse. And in a double-blind placebo-controlled trial in South Africa, it had no effect on the seizures at all. And there was one unpublished abstract which showed even at much higher doses, um, it had no effect at all. And you say, well, how is it? What is that mismatch between the preclinical data and this? Well, part of it is that actually CBD requires a lipid carrier, so something like alcohol, and a lot of these were actually being done in water, so they weren't actually getting the active ingredient. So what are the pros? So these are the things that have occurred recently, which has made a major um, um, interest in this. So there's an online Facebook survey of 150 families asking them about their experiences with CBD. 19 responses, that's only 13%. So it's a very, very biased population. 13 of those children had that SCN1A mutation syndrome that I spoke about, Dravet's, and they had an average of 12 medications each. 8 to 4% of those in this very biased population found a decrease in seizure frequency. 11 had complete, 11% 11 had complete remission in this observational study. But there was associated with drowsiness, but there are also some additional benefits in mood, alertness, and better sleep. And the thing that really caused the viral explosion was um, Charlotte Figge. So Charlotte Figge was a girl who had Drave syndrome, and she started on this medication and actually she went from having many, many, many seizures per day to virtually being seizure free. She went from being completely bedridden to being able to walk, not being able to communicate, to now being able to talk freely with her family. And that was picked up by CNN, a documentary, and then it all started to unravel. And so there was a major interest then in CBD. And as a result of that, in the States, there was an expanded access program that was put forward um, and that was approved by the FDA in which children were allowed to receive the medication. And what I'm going to show you now is um, some preliminary data coming from that, still observational, but of 27 children who were on this particular extract, the mean reduction in total seizure frequency was 4 to 4 percent. So these are children with very severe epilepsy who would have on average you know, um, even up to 100 seizures per day, and there's a 44% reduction in these children. When you look at their overall seizure response, this is what the graph looks like. First thing I want to point out to you is that 15% or four out of that 27, actually the agent made it worse. It actually made it worse. But on the other end of the spectrum, 37% had a 75 to 100% decrease. And amongst those who had complete seizure remission, it was about 20%. So some responded extremely well, some got worse. What about Dravet syndrome? Dravet syndrome, about half of them had 
um, about 50% reduction in seizure frequency. But again, in the Dravet's patients, and there were nine patients in that, not everyone got better. So you'll see that one person got worse, and actually three <coughs> patients were completely seizure-free. So it works very well in some, but not in all. But these are still observational studies in very highly motivated families. So there is a need for having randomized controlled tr trials. What about safety? So this is among 62 patients now with more than 100 patient months of treatment. 80% reported adverse events. And you will see that the side effects that you see are listed here. 40% um, report some somnolence. 26% um, some fatigue, and there are also some bowel symptoms as well. But none of these withdrawals were attributed, none of, the withdrew, none of the patients withdrew from the studies because of the adverse effects, so they were not severe enough. And there was one patient who died, <clears throat> but that was really attributed not to the medication, but because of the underlying disease itself. So the safety data is actually quite encouraging that you can get lots of side effects, but most of them are quite mild in nature. So I still adhere to the fact that what we need is proper randomized controlled trials. And the next steps for this particular medication is that um, as of last week, we were the first center in the world to have their site initiation visit for a randomized controlled trial for Dravet syndrome. We will be the first to be ready to um, recruit patients to this. And we already have patients that are lined up for this. Um, that is dependent on an, a minor amendment to the ethical approval. So we're hoping by, that by the end of this uh, month, we'll be able to start recruiting. In December, hopefully we'll have more safety and efficacy data and that will allow us to um, be able to prescribe to patients on a named patient basis. So you might have seen in, um, in the media that we were planning to do um, some trials in um, all different types of epilepsy. And that's been superseded now by two things. So we won't actually be doing that. The first thing is that um, there were only five centers in the US that was uh, um, getting the safety and efficacy data. They've moved from five centers to 17 centers. Um, so we will get more safety and efficacy data in a much shorter time than it would take for us to actually get um, the data. The second reason for doing the trial was to allow our patients access to this medication as a, um, to see if it was effective. But after the emerging safety and efficacy data, we will be able to get those to our patients on a named patient basis much quicker and without less, with less hassle. So we're hopeful um, we won't need to do that. But in the wings, there is another cannabinoid which seems even more impressive that we might be um, looking at. In January 2015, yesterday we found out that we have ethical approval for the open label study. So um, in the one that is starting at the end of this month, some children will get placebo, some children will get um, CBD. But as of uh, January 2015, we have ethical approval so that everyone will have the option to go on an open label study. So everyone will have the opportunity to try that medication, but it's only in Dravet syndrome. In February, March, on the back of that, we're hoping that we will have patients being recruited to another specific epilepsy study, um, which is focusing on lennox gusto syndrome. And I know at least one family inside here um, who would be very interested in that. So in terms of timelines, that's the kind of timelines that we're looking at. And in about February and March, hopefully we'll do um, some Clobazam interaction studies, which is going to be led um, by here in collaboration with London. So a number of different drugs being used in collaboration with these. And um, as I said, there's a, another one, or CBD, improved in waiting in the wings. So I've spoken at quite some length about the attempts that we're doing at the Muir Maxwell Epilepsy Center to try to fulfill our motto no epilepsy, better epilepsy. We're trying to address the three main mysteries. What are the cause? What is epilepsy beyond seizures? What are the different causes and how do you deal with that? And of course, we're dealing with better treatments as well. How can you help? Well, 
We are always looking for volunteers for our studies and volunteers to work with the center. You can help by raising awareness and all of this of course requires money. So um, you can help us to fundraise as well. And you can start quite young. You can see two fledgling volunteers here who um, grew some tomato plants and sold the tomato plants and um, gave the money towards the center. Um, any resemblance um, uh, is purely coincidental. <laughs> um, uh, almost finished, um, I'd like to thank all the different funders. Um, uh, and if I've excluded any or omitted any, um, deep apologies. Um, and finally, um, for Valentine's Day, I want to leave you with this thought whilst you're celebrating Spirit Thought for said Valentine, one of the patron saints of epilepsy. Thank you very much. Dr. Chin, thank you very much indeed. You worried about the begin at the beginning about the pitch. I don't think you could have got it better. You gave us a very eloquent run through a number of areas in a very complex and still quite mysterious condition. And it's fascinating to see the way you're bringing available techniques together and also looking at new and exciting uh, 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 therapeutic possibilities. It's great, particularly just from my point of view, to see the way you harness so many disciplines to bring to the, to the table, which is, uh, is quite fascinating. I think uh, over the last 200 years, Edinburgh has, uh, has uh, guarded its medical reputation very jealously. And I think, as I'm sure the audience will agree, that as far as epilepsy is concerned, epilepsy is safe in your hands as far as Edinburgh reputation is concerned. Now, I'm sure many of you may have uh, questions you would like to uh, uh, ask uh, Dr. Chin. Um, uh, please feel free, we would like to invite you to an informal reception. I've been told that this is by the elephant skeleton, so if you have a fear of, of large mammals and of skeletons, you may want to stand at this end of the cor corridor, but I'm sure that uh, Dr. Chin will be more than happy to address any questions you may have. Once again, it falls to me to thank very much indeed Dr. Chin for delivering his lecture this Thank evening. You Thank you.